Today we're going to look at the linear independence test. This is the test that you perform to a set of vectors to determine whether or not they are linearly independent. So this is that test that you see often where you're trying to find if the constants, if they all have to equal zero. If they all equal zero, then you can say that the vectors in the set are linearly independent. So the purpose of this video is to look at a really easy example, perform this test, and sort of consolidate and have a better understanding of why this test actually works and why it makes sense. So I've written on the screen here just a reminder of what our definition of linear independence is. And you can see on the screen it says that a set of vectors is linearly independent if none of them can be written as a linear combination of the others in the set. So let's take a look at a really easy example, right? Consider and let's say S1. And it's going to be composed of three vectors in R3. One of them will be 1, 0, 0. The next one will be 0, 1, 0. And the last one is going to be 1, 2, 0. Right? And we can very clearly see that the last vector in our set is a linear combination of the first two vectors. Right? We can see that 1 times 1, 0, 0 plus 2 times 0, 1, 0 is going to be equal to our last vector of the set. So from our definition of linear independence, we can see that this does not meet the definition because one of the vectors in the set can be written as a linear combination of the other vectors in the set, right? So we can say, therefore, not linearly independent, right? Specifically, we should say S1 is not linearly independent. So what we're going to do, we're going to take this equation and we're going to rewrite it very slightly just so that we have all of the vectors on the right hand side okay so what we'll do is the zero vector is going to be equal to let's move that first one to the right hand side so negative one times one zero zero let's move our second vector over we have minus two times zero one zero and now what we have left is plus 1 times 1, 2, 0. Okay. And this is just what I want to kind of keep in our back pocket, right? Let's keep this equation in our back pocket. And now let's conduct our test, just like you've probably been taught in the class. And let's see why this makes sense. So the first thing that you're often told to do is to set the vectors in the, the span. So set the span of the vectors of S1 equal to the zero vector, right? And if we were going to do that, then we would be left with some constant times the first vector in our, in our set S1 plus some constant times the second vector plus some constant times the third vector. This is equal to the zero vector. And we should also define S1, S2, and S3, or C1, C2, and C3, I mean. Let's define them as some constants. Okay, perfect. Okay, now what we can do from this, right, we can notice that this is going to be a system of linear equations, right? We can see from the first entries, we have 1 times c1, right? 1 times c1 plus 0 times c2 plus 1 c3 is equal to 0. We can also see 0 c1 plus 1 times c2 plus 2 times c3 is equal to the 0 vector. And then from the last equation, we just get 0 plus 0 plus 0 equals 0. Right? Just a reminder that we can we can see that we have a system of linear equations here. 
right? It's just written in one vector equation. What you can also notice is that this, this span of S1 equals zero vector, this can also just be rewritten as a matrix vector product, right? If we had a matrix that's the columns of our vectors here, and we multiply it by the vector c1, c2, and c3 are the entries, and this is equal to the right-hand side of our vector equation, the zero vector. Well, you can see that this is the exact same thing, right? If you were to perform this matrix vector product, then you can see that we would just end up with the computation would literally be that first step, right? C1 times the first vector, first column of our matrix, plus C2 times the second column, plus C3 times the last column of our matrix, right? That is just by definition how we would perform a matrix vector product here. So what we're really doing here is we are solving a, a homogeneous system of some matrix A, right, times the vector C equals zero, right? And you can, you might see this more oftenly expressed as like, you know, AX equals zero, right? The solutions to this, we can also notice that this is actually just the null space, right? The null space would be all the solutions to this equation, right? And I've got loads of other videos on null space on my channel. Um, but you can see how all these things, they're very connected. They're different, but they're connected. So we're really just solving a homogeneous system here. Reminder that homogeneous system just means that this right-hand side is zero. If it was a non-homogeneous system, you might just see it written as like a vector B, right? But you can see because we're setting the span of S1 equal to the zero vector, that's going to make it a homogeneous system. If we were to solve this homogeneous system, right, what we would do, we would row reduce our matrix, right? 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 2, 0. And a homogeneous system, it would have that right side of that matrix, right, that vertical line, and then 0, 0, 0. Because this is so unnecessary to write, because it's just a bunch of zeros, Oftentimes, we just completely don't write it. And we just row reduce this matrix right here, right? But just a reminder that we do have that implicit row of zero or column of zeros on the right hand side, right? So just keep in mind that that is always going to be there, okay? And when we row reduce this, remember we are solving for the solutions to our equation A times C equals zero. So our column right here, our column vector C1, C2, C3, those are the solutions that we would read when we are uh, reducing the matrix. And we can see that this matrix, because we have chosen such a simple system, it's already row reduced for us, so we don't need to do any Gaussian elimination here, right? We can just read the solutions right away, right? And we can see, well, first things first, we notice that there's no leading entry in our third column, Therefore, our C3 column is going to be a parameter, and let's call that T, where T is some real number. You might be like, why are we changing the variable? C3 is already a, a real number, so why are we changing it to T? We change it to T just because notation, we often see the notation as either S or T or R. We're just being clear now that we have determined that C3 is a parameter. At first it was kind of unknown, it's just, right, it's just the constant uh, in our span, but now we know for sure that C3 can be anything, so we'll just give it a new name, okay, and we'll say that C3 is equal to T, right, at least that's how I have always justified this change, okay. We can read off of our uh, reduced matrix from row one, we can see, and let me just double, I'll be very clear here, that these columns kind of represent our coefficients that are tacked on to this, uh, the entries of our solution vector. So we can see that one times C1 plus zero times C2 plus 
1 times c3, and c3 was just t, is equal to 0. Remember, we, our right-hand side is a homogeneous system. It's always equal to 0 in this case. Okay, right? We can see that c2 is canceled out, and we're left with c1 is equal to minus t. Great. Okay, from row 2, we can see, and uh, let's just be clear here. This is from row 1. From row 2, we can see that 0c1 plus 1c2 plus 2 times t, remember c3 is t, is equal to 0 because it's a homogeneous system. So now we can see that our c1 is cancelled out and we are left with c2 is minus 2 times t. Let's make a little bit of space here. Okay. We can now very clearly see that our solution, c1, c2, and c3, we have that parameter, right? Minus t, minus 2t, and t. So there's many solutions. So you might already know we have many solutions. We've got non-zero solutions. Therefore, the set of vectors S1 is going to be linearly dependent. Right? They are not linearly independent. So let's take a look. Why? Why does this make sense? Okay. Let's finally let's make it. Let's go full circle. Like enough of this computation. Why does this make sense? So let's just factor out our t here, just for clarity. Right. Let's select t is equal to one. Okay. When t is equal to one, we can see that c one is equal to minus one c2 is equal to minus 2, c3 is equal to 1, okay? This is just one possible solution. Oh, let me scroll down, okay? But remember what we started with, okay? What did we start with? At first, we, we took a look at these vectors, and we said, okay, super obvious. This third vector is going to be written as 1 times the first vector plus 2 times the second. What we did here, we rewrote this as negative 1 times the first vector plus, or minus 2 times the second vector plus 1 times the third vector, right? And then this is equal to the zero vector. This was just a rearranged form of the equation that told us that one of the vectors is a linear combination of the other vectors in the set, right? Let me repeat that. We constructed this equation here right? Because we were able to see that one of the vectors was a linear combination of the other vectors in the set, okay? So we can very clearly see now, right? When you look at our span of S1 equals zero, which is the first step for our linear independence test, we'll take a look. C1 is negative one, c2 is negative 2, and c3 is equal to 1, right? So we found non-zero solutions for c1, c2, and c3, which lets us construct this equation, right? And this equation tells us that we can rewrite the vectors as a linear combination, or one of the vectors as a linear combination of the other vectors in the set, right? If we had not like the uh, a trivial solution, only trivial solution. So that means that c1, c2, and c3, they have to equal zero. Basically, this the only way that this equation can be true is if c1, c2, and c3 are equal to zero. That makes sense, right? Zero plus zero plus zero will be equal to zero. But if that's the only solution, well, that tells us that we can only write this Right? If they're all equal to zero, and if they're all equal to zero, we're not able to kind of create this equation that shows that one of the vectors can be rewritten as a linear combination of the other vectors in the set. I'll say that once more. Right? If C1, C2, and C3 equals, uh, from this span of S1 equals zero, uh, the zero vector, if the only solutions are C1, C2, and C3 have to equal zero, 
then we're not able to create this equation that shows that one of the vectors is a linear combination of the other vectors in the set. So I hope that this kind of clears things up if you were just blindly performing this operation. Hopefully this video makes, a, makes things make a little bit more uh, logical and makes sense when you're performing these, uh, these calculations uh, on uh, a test or a midterm. So yeah, good luck and happy studying.